Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we pray that our hearts would now be opened to your word as written by the great Apostle Paul, who under the inspiration and influence of the Holy Spirit gave such true and lively words that we have set our course by them. We thank you for his life and for his influence, and we pray now that we might do justice in some small measure to the incredible word that he's given to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. morning. Yeah, it was an awesome day yesterday. I have to say that um, Fran and I left both um, riding high in so many ways. It was, um, it was just wonderful to be in a church that is in sync with its leader and in love with the Lord and then to see the joy and the excitement in RD as Monica appeared in the back. I had an inside scoop because I'm, I'm off with R.D. in the other room and, you know, he's a pretty cool customer, R.D., right? He's pretty relaxed and I know he's, he's, he's wound up in, in many ways, but he was, he's never nervous. I've seen him in, you know, speak to many, many people. He's never nervous. Yesterday, oh my gosh, he was, he was pacing, pacing back and forth. And he had written out those vows that he had read to Monica, which were beautiful. And he kept opening them up, putting them back in, opening them up, putting them back in. Where are my vows? Oh, there they are. Okay, I'm okay, okay. He he was just, RD, it's okay, and relax. And and, uh, Maddie's um, concern was um, all the people. They're all going to be looking at me. Um, There's too many people in there. What, What if I faint? And... I just said, um, Maddie, you, you'll be fine. They're not, trust me, they're not looking at you. <laughs> and um, we left, really, I think, Fran, wouldn't you say it was one of the most beautiful weddings we'd ever been to? Um, and it wasn't just the sermon, was it? It was just, uh, it was, uh, <clears throat> actually, yeah, it was, it was so much more than that. It was, I mean, literally so much more. Uh, those children, when they came up and prayed, that, we'd, I'd never seen that. That was just so wonderful. And, uh, and then the three men that came up and blessed this couple. Um, we, um, we probably shouldn't have done this, but last night, Fran texted Monica through RD. No answer. Um, this morning, I texted him, told him what I was going to preach on. No answer. So that's all a good sign. The... Um, One other thing about R.D., if I may. I was listening to his sermon of last week um, as it is streamed on the Internet. I have to say, I get out a lot. I know our Anglican tribe really, really well. You probably don't know the gift you have in R.D., just as as a communicator, as a teacher. Maybe for you, he's, he's all you've ever known. And so you think, well, here he is again. Or maybe I should sleep in. Or maybe I should, and if you're live streaming this, you say, well, man, I can sit, sit home and watch it. I want to encourage you in so many ways to give thanks to God for the gift that you have, that God has given this young man. And that the, I, I would say to you as a senior uh, priest now in the church, that it's an incumbent upon the leadership and the, the vestry, your, your session, your executive teams, the staff, to come around this young man and hi, uh, enable him to highlight that gift, and use that gift, and encourage him to let go of a lot of the other non-gifting things that go along with being the director of a volunteer organization. Um, I, I, I say this to you in all candor, you have, you have a gift in a prize in RD. So steward it wisely. So 
let's get to this amazing passage today. I've, I've given some slides here to them, and let's see, I, I have a little pointer, so God willing, it will all work out. My um, topic this morning is from Galatians 3. Do you have Bibles? Would you please get them out? And um, let's see if we can advance that slide one more time. Oh, there it is. There you go. Okay. What, is, um, what our reader said this morning in very enthusiastic tones, quite rightly, is, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Another way to say it. Who has beguiled you? Who, um, who has literally hypnotized you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. We need to use that as the theme verse for getting into the rest of the just a few verses that I can cover this morning. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? When's the last time you used the word bewitched in a sentence? It's a great way to say, what were you thinking? What got into you? Those of you parents of teenagers, take a lesson. Who has bewitched you, you might say to them, when they come home late? Galatians 3, here we go, wait a minute. Um, I'm getting it. And as you know the story, I'm going to go back and just review. There were these people that were referred to by scholars as the Judaizers. It's a fancy name for people who were trying to get the new Christians to observe the old ways of Moses, the old Mosaic law, the old teaching of the Old Testament. And it's a problem because Paul comes in with this idea that Jesus Christ has died for our sins. We're now free. We have this incredible freedom and liberty in the gospel. And along comes a tribe of Judaizers. And they're saying to the people, because Paul's gone by now, yes, it's wonderful, but you must do this. But you must do that. And in many ways, you can think of their role as... Um, employing math, all four functions of math. They were adding to the gospel. They were saying, in, in so many words, yes, the cross is great, but what are you bringing to the table? What can you do to show how serious you are about appropriating this faith? There must be some things that you can do, and we'll talk about them in just a few minutes. <clears throat> then they then began to subtract from the authority of the Apostle Paul. This is why, if you remember, a few weeks ago, when you covered it in Galatians chapter 1 and 2, you covered the fact that Paul is kind of flashing his resume. Hey, you think, you don't think, you know who I am. Don't forget, I have received my commission by revelation. These guys, by second and third or fourth hand, I've received it by revelation. And who am I to speak? And he goes and he lists his resume, his CV, the way of his life, the course of his life in such a way that it appears that he's bragging about who he is and the accomplishments that he has had under the Jewish law. And this guy was everything. I mean, I promise you, you probably know a lot of people in your life. You have a lot of friends, a lot of eccentric friends maybe, a lot of people that are really into one thing or another. You don't know any, anyone like the Apostle Paul. You don't know anybody who's like that kind of Pharisee who is so precise about everything he does. Every, every T is crossed, every I is dotted, every pan is washed, every meticulous item of the law is observed without fail. And Paul lays that out. I was this, but I received this commission, this revel- by, by revelation. We're going to talk about this in a moment, but God found me. I, wa- I wasn't looking for him. God found me on this 
rode to Damascus and gave me this incredible conversion of my own heart. Well, the Judaizers were doing something else as well. They were <clears throat> multiplying the options that you can use to be saved. You know, Jesus plus whatever, that, that's actually just as multiplication, right? Jesus plus that, or this, or that, or this. That there are all kinds of little tricks, little hacks, that we can use in our life to be sure that the gospel is for us. Little bits of morality. I can do this or I can, do, I, can made the, I can say this magic prayer. I can trust in my guardian angel. I can um, make only right turns on Tuesdays. I can do all kinds of little things that kind of shape and sculpt my life. Therefore, I am controlled and disciplined. And that adds, got to add up for something when it comes to salvation. Of course, what that does, doesn't it? If you realize that there's not one door into the entrance of the kingdom, but there's 10 doors or 15 doors, it creates anxiety. Well, which... Which door should I go in? Have I tried all the doors that are open to me? So these Judaizers were multiplying the options. And the other thing that they were doing is that they were dividing the church. This is one of the great contributions that Galatians makes, <clears throat> is it puts everybody on equal footing. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave, free. They all have access into the kingdom. And what the Judaizers are doing is saying, no, you have to, if you're going to come in this door, you've got to go through this route to get into that door. And that just divides the church, as you'll see in just a few minutes. Do you have um, infomercials up here in Canada? These were the guys who were the, but wait, there's more. They would come after everything had been said, every sermon preached by the Apostle Paul. And they would say, that's great. Glad you heard that. Glad you were there. Glad you joined up. But there's more you can do. You can add a little of your own efforts here, and that actually will secure your salvation. And I know what you're thinking. I don't read minds very well, but I, I can read yours. You're thinking to yourself, what is the big deal? I mean, so what? Why not add a little human effort to this and you get a win-win, right? Jesus died for my sins, that's a win. Then I can die to myself and you know, shape my life up and make me moral and right. And that plus me is is a win, win, right? Paul must have in mind the incredible experience that he had at his conversion. He must, in his mind, have been going back to this moment when on the road to Damascus <clears throat> with a fistful of documents in his hand ready to arrest and imprison families, separate husbands and wives and children, and in some way even participate in the murder of Christians. He must have had this in mind because something so thoroughly happened to him. He wasn't expecting it. He contributed nothing to it. And yet he was absolutely, as you see in the famous painting, of the conversion of the Apostle Paul, he was floored by it. He must, there must have been something in his mind about this. I mean, today, somebody like the Apostle Paul, who does today what he did then, listen up, look at me, somebody today who was just like the Apostle Paul would be referred to as a terrorist. 
He would be someone who, under religious zeal, takes the lives of others lightly and the weight of the law he believes fervently and tries to kill him. And Paul's on his way to Damascus <clears throat> up in Syria. And he has no, he's not asking for clarity. He's not asking for wisdom. He's not asking for direction. He has it. And bam, he falls. He falls to the ground, and there is this thunderous sound. And Paul is blinded. He can't see a thing. And he hears these words, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he, and he, can't, he can't believe what he's hearing. Who, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And his entire world shifted. It was like, <clears throat> you remember years ago there was an earthquake in, it was southern Chile. And it so rocked the world that the rotation of the earth lost about four milliseconds. It was so earth shattering that everything sh had to shift with it. And Paul's conversion was just that. And you, you notice how personal it is. Why are you persecuting me? You, Saul. Not the Pharisees in Jerusalem and not, not, <clears throat> not your bosses. Why are you, you, what is he, maybe 27 years old, 28 years old? Why are you doing this, Saul? <clears throat> and why are you persecuting me? Lord, I, I, I'm actually trying to protect you. I'm trying to purify you. The, the, the faith, he said, no, it's persecution. And Paul realized, you know, when he finally found this, the truth, when he discovered the truth, when he realized how absolutely powerful and earth-shattering it was, he, he, he had to re-engineer his entire thinking. It took him, some scholars say, three years, some say up to 14 years to go away on retreat and rewire that vast intellect of his. Because what he was not looking for found him. And so when he tells the, the Galatians, you foolish Galatians, Who's hypnotized you? I gave you everything there was. You had, I gave it perfectly. And what you can do matters not to what God has done. And I speak of it personally, the Apostle Paul would say. I was doing everything according to the law, according to the traditions of my fathers. I was doing it all. And God came in with a sideways block, tackled me down, broke my eyes, spoke to my ears, and I was never the same again. I did nothing. He did everything. You see what I mean? So when, when uh, these Galatians say, well, <clears throat> actually we've decided that we love the Lord Jesus and love the gospel, but we're also going to keep kosher... Um, kitchens just to be sure that we're there. Paul says, you foolish people. That doesn't mean anything. And why would you throw up a roadblock to those who want to come in the faith by saying, oh, you got to be, you know, keep a kosher kitchen. What is it that is true? This is I, 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 think this is, I think this is a, um, a, a fact. Conversion is such a jolt to the system that it changes you from the inside out, and it hurts. There ought to be things that happen in your life when you're converted, when you get the idea of who God is and what Christ has done and what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you that actually feel like ripping tearing, breakage, wounding. 
John Bunyan, the great <coughs> writer, the great Puritan, said 1688, conversion, he died in 1688, conversion is not the smooth, easygoing process of you know, self-awareness, of discovering that this is really a lifestyle and a philosophy I want to embrace. No, he says it's, a, it's wounding work, this breaking of the hearts, by without wounding, there is no saving. Where there is a grafting, there will always be a cutting. The graft must be let in with a wound. To stick it on to the outside or to tie it on to a string would be, would be of no use. That's, you know, that's, that's horticultural language. You don't graft on a branch just by tying it next to the branch you want it to go to. You have to break open something, create a wound, so that when it heals, it is, as he says here, heart must be set to heart and back to back, or there will be no sap from the root to branch. And this, I say, must be done by a wound, by a cut. And so what happened in these Galatian lives is that they gradually became Christians, and they didn't realize that that actually meant stopping some things and not picking them up again. Or they didn't, actually, they, they didn't realize that it actually meant that they don't have to do all the other things that the world is saying that they should do. I wonder if you just permit me a, just a brief illustration to make a point. <clears throat> Later on in Paul's life, he goes to um, Ephesus. This is the library at Ephesus that stands today. It's a massive city back in the day, 200,000 people. It's a very, very, very small church that Paul was engaged with there. And uh, there was a series of um, teachers that came. One of them was Apollos. Apollos was a brilliant orator. He was a spellbinder. But he had a, a deficiency in his teaching. He was corrected by um, a couple in Corinth, but his deficiency is he thought the gospel was all about the forgiveness of sin and never about the empowerment of a man or a woman by the Holy Spirit. It was a spiritless faith. So when Paul gets to Ephesus and he starts to say, you know, uh, hey, what's going on here? And they, they have this conversation back and forth. And he says, wait a minute, did you receive the Holy Spirit <clears throat> when, you know, you came to faith? And they said, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And Paul says, what? And he preaches the Holy Spirit. They're baptized. They receive the Holy Spirit. And then here's what happens. This is the, the, this is the big issue. <clears throat> These Christians who had received the gospel minus the Holy Spirit went back to their homes and purged their homes of all the magic books and the incantations and the idols and the little, little homunculus and all the little things that they had around their shelves, all the little gods, and they brought them on. They said, I guess we won't need these anymore. Now, think about that for a moment. You know what that means? It means that these Christians in Ephesus, they went to church, they were Christians, they sat like you did, but back home, they were hedging their bets. They had their own magic books. They had their own little false religion, their own little urban religion or suburban religion or political religion or whatever it is, just in case the big thing didn't work out, they have the little thing to fall back on. And this revival breaks out and everybody brings all the members of the church, bring all the things they had formerly relied upon. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. I'm a believer in Christ. I've been a believer since the apostle. Then Apollos was here. Forgiveness of sins. I want my forgiveness of sins. I didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. So I've been relying upon these little idols and trinkets and magic things and tarot cards and horoscopes and you fill in the blank to make up for what I could have been lacking in the faith. 
The point I'm trying to make is this, that when you're bewitched and lulled into believing that somehow you need to add something to the faith of the gospel, it usually is because you don't have the faith or the teaching or the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's, you think it's religion plus me uh, is going to make it. And Paul says, you're bewitched. You're absolutely bewitched. So what I'd been saying, again, this is all by review. <laughs> Sorry, R.D., I'm just um, going to take a little longer than maybe you do. But um, I, I, I said, how long do you preach? He said, as long as you need. I said, okay. <laughs> the, well, what happened, and I, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I just want to remind you what was at stake because what these Judaizers were saying is, okay, you young Christians, you want in the door, but actually there's another way. There, you have to go in the, the Jewish way, the Mosaic way. You've got to get circumcised. And I just want you to imagine, not graphically, but imagine what a showstopper that is. You know, welcome to our church. We've had our, our newcomers meeting. We welcome you. If you'll step outside, men, on this side. We have a little procedure we want you to endure. I promise you, in Canada or the U.S., not a single church plant will be called Church of the Circumcision. Not a single one. And you know the other thing that's true about circumcision? There's just the men. Circumcision actually cuts the women off from being able to have a personal faith of their own. So it says uh, the men are there, and they're the ones, the primary relators to God, and then the women come in the background, and, and Paul will have none of this. It's not faith plus circumcision, and this is why. Circumcision is a huge stumbling block for the Gentiles, especially if you're an adult male. Are you kidding me? I'll take my chances on whatever else I have to do besides that. But so the Judaizers would say, but, 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 but wait, there's more, there's more. For the ladies, we have dietary restrictions. Those of you who love to cook, we have a special kitchen that you can keep. Kosher kosher foods. And you could do this and this and this, and there was this belief that you had to go that way to get to faith. Well, there was circumcision, which was directed toward the men, obviously. There was um, dietary laws, which directed toward men and women, but primarily women, who were the preparers of the food. And then there were, of course, these what he will call later on, and you'll see in the book, special observances, fast days, feast days, holy days, holidays, these observances. And that's the first two take things away, right? This last one was, you got to party, but you have to party our way at these moments. And the apostle Paul says, <clears throat> not a chance. You cannot have the gospel and then throw these new things to do, because what it does is it takes away the value of the cross. Do you see that? That if, 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 if I add anything to the cross, then the cross is diminished in Paul's view. So Paul will say, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And I don't know how this happened, but Paul's understanding of the cross must have been so rich and deep and vivid to him that he was able to publicly portray Jesus as crucified. And that was all it took. They weren't there, of course, for the crucifixion, right? They were there for the sermon that the Apostle Paul gave. And then he asks four questions. I'll close with this. You can see them when you look at the text. 
So the first question is actually rhetorical. Who has bewitched you? But the second question is, um, and I've got them paraphrased up here, so let me read the text and I'll paraphrase it. Verse 2, let me ask you only this, but he's not only one question, actually four. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now think about this. If you have come to faith, think about this very carefully. If you are a believer in Christ, how did you get there? Was it because you worked with your hands, you did something, and then finally uncovered it, discovered it yourself? Was it obeying certain rules or restrictions that brought you to faith in Christ? No. It was actually disobeying certain rules and restrictions, and then having you hear by the ear that there is a solution for the sin. And that was such sweet music to you, you wanted to sing that song, and you were converted to that song. Are you with me? The reformers said that the ears are the organ of faith. You have to hear the gospel being preached. It's not the work of the law. So, by were you converted by effort or by the ear? Well, okay, by the ear. Next, um, next question. Um, <clears throat> having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? That is, once we got you started on this road to forgiveness, have you discovered that somehow you're you're better than all things, everyone? Have you ris Did you rise above your own faith now? Have all your sins gone away? Put your hand up if you are now fully sanctified. No, no one is. You didn't rise above your faith. He's asking this of these Christians. Did you suffer so many things in vain? In other words, was there something of the suffering that you endured? We don't know what it was. But was there some suffering that actually made you think, I must be missing something. There must be something wrong in my life. Maybe if I start doing this, maybe if I actually start to eat kosher, I'll be better. Paul says, did you suffer in vain? And the fourth question, of effectively, do you believe in magic? Does he who supplies the spirit to you work miracles among you, do so by works of the law? That is, do you think you control God, which is magic? Do you think the things you do on earth actually create something happening in the spiritual realm, which is voodoo? Do you believe in voodoo? Do you believe in magic? Or is this all one-way grace from God to us? Well, these are four questions that he's asking and that every one of us need to be clear about in our own mind. How did we come to faith? Didn't we hear it? Wasn't it revealed to us? We didn't discover it. It was shown, like the Apostle Paul. We don't believe in magic. We don't believe in voodoo. We believe in the cross. And the cross is something that I can trust. The other way of living is I can, I can try harder. And I just want to, in closing, put up this tombstone of mine um, that I'm thinking about. You know, you put your name on a tombstone and you, your date of birth. You do the math. I'm 62. I know. Get, get that out of the mind. I'm, I'm, I'm 62. <laughs> What do you put on the tombstone to signify, you know, the efforts that you made to become a righteous person? At least he tried. And Paul would say that is pathetic. You poor, sorry, foolish person. At least you tried. Christ's cross when you die, should allow you instead to say, at last, he trusted. I, I trusted. And from that level of trust,
came all the joy and the freedom and the liberty and the opportunity to serve and of all the ways that I want to bring my life under the Lordship of Christ, those are all, I should do those. But I don't want the Christian faith to leave me with a worry or a doubt. I tried, well, am I gonna make it? No. Paul says in his loving way to these Galatians, look, I just need you to trust that as Abraham had the faith, to believe God, and that was credited to him as righteousness. I'm saying to you, trust. Once you get to that point of, ah, I get it. I do nothing, he does everything. I need everything, he needs nothing, and he gives it all to me. That makes him the greatest God imaginable. And it makes me the most confident sinner I could ever hope to be. Because I will continue to sin, but I know that by God's grace, his cross, his blood covers my sin. Father, your word is as rich today as it was when it was written by the great apostle. And we pray that these things might now be laid in our heart that we would think about them deeply and sincerely and then live a life of confidence and hope. And all this I pray in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ.